Welcome to another episode of Money and Medicine. Today we're going to talk a little bit about property. Um, we're also going to look at why property. Um, and the guest that's joining us in the studio is nobody else than the CEO, founder of Prosperity Enterprises, Jaku Groblar. Um, Jaku, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. But just before we start there, I want to encourage you guys, if this is the very first time that you are watching Money and Medicine, um, go to the bottom of this page, subscribe, see if you like the content. The purpose of this channel is to educate and empower medical professionals. We've also started a platform which you can check out. It's www.moneyandmedicine.co.za. Please feel free to go and have a look where we share free resources for all medical graduate professionals. Thank you. So, Yaku. Welcome. Um, it's, it's a pleasure having you here. Um, I've worked very closely with you in the past. You're also a personal friend uh, to myself. And um, just share a little bit about your story. You know, I know you are a CFA um, and I know you grew up in Bloom, a small sort of relative <laughs> small, <laughs> small town compared to Freestate. Johannesburg, yeah, Free State. So what brought you to, to Joburg and, and why property? Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Werner. It's um, a real privilege and a real honor to be here today. And I'm very excited for the knowledge that we can share uh, today and the topics, the, the topic that we are discussing today, a very, very passionate property investor myself. And I'm excited that we can look at why property is such a great investment and, and to talk through that. But firstly, a little bit about myself. Like you said, Stefan, I am from Bloemfontein. I've been living for, uh, I've been living in Johannesburg for quite some time. And um, for, for me, the opportunity was here and I wanted to come to Johannesburg and um, get established here um, with, with all the opportunity that is, that is here. So um, my background is, is mainly finance. So um, I was a CFO for a wholesale company that was operating across or that, that operates across Africa. And um, property was always a hobby for me. So it was always something that I would do in my free time. Uh, when we were still in Bloemfontein, we would, for example, on a Friday afternoon after work, we'll climb in our cars, we'll drive to Johannesburg, and we'll have 10, 15 property viewings on a Saturday and a Sunday uh, to come look at property investments and to wow. um, build our property portfolio. And it's something that first started slowly. And as we continue to build our property portfolio, obviously we started to pick up speed and, and um, became more experienced in it and more skilled in the type of deals that we were doing. Um, started to look a bit different, um, but an amazing journey, you know, and, and what was so amazing for me, or what is so amazing for me about property is the fact that it's something that you can do, even if you are a professional, or if you work long hours, or if you are in corporate, and, and that's, that's why I'm so excited about what we're going to discuss today. 100%. So, Yaku, also, um, I have to share, you brought out a book, uh, it's called Prosperity Through Property. What, just a brief overview of the book, just a one-liner, what is the book all about? Obviously property, but you share some strategies into starting and also where can somebody get this book? Absolutely, yeah. So, so Prosperity Through Property, um, we specifically wrote in very plain language um, for everyone to understand. So it's not a technical book. There's maybe here and there a technical part, but, but it's mostly, it reads very, very easy. And it's about how you create financial freedom and how you build wealth through property. Awesome. I think it ties in very much to, to um, the focus that we have with this platform as well. We try to, to put out information in, in layman terms where people can access this type of information at their convenience. Um, because I think a lot of people would like to invest in property, but they don't necessarily know where to start. Um, so maybe if you can start off, what does property investment entails? Great. So with, with property investment, it, it, it's so important that when you when you are looking at becoming a property investor even if it is something that you want to do in your free time or even if it is um, part of the investments that you want to make is that you start and and how you start is to invest in yourself first that is always the first step that you will that you will take we always say you can't produce what is not in you so you need to get that education you need to get that knowledge first and 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 hence it is extremely important that you educate yourself that you read that you attend um, courses or seminars that you speak to people that are actually investing in property because that's that's the starting point for me um, and and then after that to to take that first step so many people are afraid to take the step and 
for me, it's sometimes better to take that first step, even if it's not the greatest property invest, investment, but, but to take that step and to start the journey. I always say with my first property acquisition, I learned more about property than all the books and all the courses and everything I attended, even though those things were very important. But I had to take that practical step to get out of, uh, to, 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 to get into the game of, yeah. of property. And, and that might mean buying a small buy to rent property um, or a, an apartment that you buy and that you rent out. It may even mean when you start out to buy a place for you to live in. Yeah. But, but to, in, at the back of your head, also think about the investment prospects of that property. Yeah, okay, so you mentioned to empower yourself. I'm also a big fan of that. Um, but what book played the biggest role in your life in terms of real estate? Um, I know you're obviously sharing a lot through your book, and I, and I would strongly recommend for potential investors to, to buy your book. But what book would have made a big difference in your life, or what reading material? I think if I have to single out a few sources, um, I really enjoyed Dolph de Ruiz's uh, book, Real Estate Riches. Um, it's written more in an American context, but a lot of those principles, most of those principles, in fact, were principles that we can apply in, in, in South Africa as well. And then, of course, Robert Kiyosaki's books were also a very great place to start. Um, and a lot of people don't know this, but Rich Dad Poor Dad is actually a property book, if you think about it. You know, um, he speaks about a lot of different concepts and so on, but... It, um, a lot of it is actually about property investment. So that's also, of course, a great, a great place to start. Okay. Um, Jakob, so what is the big difference between property investments and paper investments? And when I say paper investments, unit trust, retirement annuities, what's the big difference? I think what I absolutely love about property is that it's tangible. It's something that you can touch. It's something that you can see. It's something that you can smell. And over and above that, its correlation is also not that closely related to other paper assets, which means that it's very good from a diversification perspective to have property in your portfolio as well. So its returns also looks different. And, and all of those are reasons for me why property should form part of your greater investment portfolio. Um, Jaku, that, that brings me to the next question in, and how do you measure the growth on a physical property? Because we know when you invest um, in normal unit trust as an example, property might be one of the asset classes. So it's easy to measure the, the returns on that if you just pull a normal investment statement. But uh, investing in a physical property, maybe what you call a, a, a buy to rent property as an example, how do you measure the, the, the return on that investment? That's a very important question, Werner. And a lot of people make, uh, make the mistake of measuring property in the wrong way when they are looking at the return. So often you would read articles speaking about the performance of property as an investment, and then it is completely wrongly analyzed. So, so the, thanks for that question. The thing about properties, you've got, two in, you've got two returns and you need to take both into consideration. On the one side, you've got your net rental yield, which is your rental income or the cash flow that that property is generating for you on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, you of course have an asset that is an appreciating in value. So you've got the capital growth of that property. So if you want to, if you want to know how a property is performing, you need to take both of those into consideration. So in other words, let's say your rental income, less all your expenses. Now those would be expenses such as your levies and your rates and taxes and your maintenance, et cetera, um, comes to say 6% of the, of the value of, or the purchase price of the property. And the property also appreciated with 6% over that year. Your total, what we call ungeared return or your unleveraged return, would be 12%. It would be the 6% from the capital growth and it would be the 6% from the net rental yield that the property has uh, generated. But then over and above that, and this is where it becomes very, very interesting, is very seldom do you buy a property with your own money. Usually you would use a little bit of your own money, but the majority of the property would be financed by the bank. And that changes everything. Because the moment that you bring leverage into the equation, and when I say leverage into the equation, I mean you don't just use your own money, but you also use the bank's money. It changes your returns completely. Leverage is like an amplif uh, leverage is like a, um, amplifier. It amplifies whatever is there already. So if you have a small positive return, leverage can turn that small positive return into a big positive return. 
and of course counts for the other side as well. If you have a small negative return, it will amplify that into a big negative return. So property and leverage go so well together for that reason. In the last 50 years, only three years have property prices actually depreciated from the previous year. So for 47 of the last 50 years, property prices have appreciated. So when we talk about risk, we talk about volatility of price and, and uh, we especially look at downside risk or the probability that the value of your asset can decrease. And with property, that's very seldom, or, or in property, that is something that very seldom happens. It's very seldom that you see the value of the asset, which is the property, depreciate, which means that you can safely bring, or safely and responsibly, of course, bring leverage into the equation to make a big difference in the returns that you can generate in your property. In terms of identifying the ideal property um, to yield a good return, what factors do you have to take into account when you identify a property like that? And I'm asking the question because um, a couple of years ago when I bought my first property, like you said, you, you learn quite a lot from property when you actually buy that first property. Um, the one thing is um, I soon quick, like actually quickly realized that in the area that you buy, there's, there's, a, there's a type of a ceiling. So you can't charge more than a certain amount of rent or you can't basically resell that property because all the neighboring properties have a certain ceiling. Um, and sometimes I think um, from inexperience, you, you make the mistake where you want to renovate your property um, and you overcapitalize on it and you won't be able to sell it for, for such a value where you're basically getting, then going to realize a loss. Um, and the other option is if you don't want to realize that loss, if you've overcapitalized pro probably on a property, um, if you have to rent it out, you're only going to get a certain amount of rent. Um, what I also picked up is certain properties, um, your more expensive properties, um, it's very difficult to get to get tenants for them because those kind of people that can afford a property where they probably pay a rent for 30, 40,000 rand a month might as well just go buy a property. So how do you identify, what factors do you take into account to identify a, a good property from a, for an investment? Yeah, thanks, thanks for that question, Van, and also for the very valid comments that you made. The very first thing that you need to do when you decide to start investing in property is what strategy are you going to follow? Because there's a lot of different strategies out there. And through that strategy, you will also then determine what type of properties you would like to invest in. Very important, and I think you touched on a lot of, of a very important comment or very important points. Um, when it comes to finding and acquiring the right investment property is Prices, price, the, the price that you pay is critically important. Um, I love Warren Buffett's quote. He always says, price is what you pay, value is what you get. And you want to make sure that you acquire your property at the right price. That, that is the single most important thing for me once you've determined your strategy and, and you know what strategy you are going to follow is the price that you pay on that property. Um, in all the books of property, you will always read, they say you make your money in property when you buy not when you sell. So you want to make sure that you acquire the property below market value. How do you do that? By being patient. I always say property investing is a lot like fishing. You know, you need to put a lot of lines in the water and then you need to wait for a bite. So you need to look for property investments and, and when you find a property that, that fits your strategy, you need to submit an offer to purchase. And it may be that a lot of the offer to purchase that you submit are not going to be um, accepted and only a few would be accepted. So that's a very, very valid point. And, and then the point that you made about overcapitalization is, is critically important is know your market, know the suburb, know what properties are selling for and what properties are renting for. Because when you've got that information, you can, you get, you can know how much you can spend on that property and still make a good return, uh, a return on the property. Then I love to buy the cheapest property in a suburb. You know, that, that is a strategy that I've always followed through my life is um, I would identify certain suburbs where I would like to invest that fits my strategy. And I would, for example, identify a type. I'm very fond of two bedroom, one bathrooms or two bedroom, two bathroom units, for example. And once I've determined that, I would go and look for the most affordable properties in that within that strategy that I can acquire and then I've got room to improve and to renovate and and still earn a decent rent and 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 earn a decent return from the capital growth.
on that, um, how important is it to look at the financials of, let's say, a complex? Because you might find, you said you're going to look for the cheapest property in, in a specific suburb. Uh, it might be that that property is so cheap for a good reason. Number one, it might not be maintained. Yes. And if it's maintained, there might be a financial problem within that complex, so, which might cause uh, future problems to you. Absolutely. Yeah, and I also want to add to that question, what other risks are there to, to, to just be aware of? You know, if you buy at a lower than market value, what, what sort of risks have you encountered just for people to be cautious of? So they, they pick up this bargain and like Van has said, it might be because the financial situation of the complex is down or it might be that, you know, there's, it's a high crime area that you, that you weren't necessarily aware of. What risks have you sort of encountered? Right, great. So to, to, to answer your, the first question, Van, about um, looking at the financials of a body corporate or an estate or whatever the case may be is, is critically important because... Um, that is almost like a little business. Let's call it an, a not-for-profit organization that's, that's, a, that's running. And um, that, that determines uh, so much of, of or, or that plays such a big role in the returns that you are going to generate out of that property. So you need to make sure two things. Number one, the levies are reasonable because one of the things that we have seen that uh, one of the biggest things that can throw your investment completely off is you buy a property, it's at a great price, but the levies are so high that your, your rental yield or your net rental yield comes out to be very poor. So that's very, very important. And then also the financials has to be in a healthy position. Um, some of the things that you can look at is what outstanding debts does the body corporate have? How well do they collect uh, their levies on a monthly basis? And, and then is there sufficient cash reserves? I think that's one of the first things that you can, can look at. What I would very often do when I buy a unit is I would go, go to the financial statements, I would look at how, many, how much cash reserves there are or how much cash there is in the bank, and I would divide that by the number of units in the complex or the estate because then very quickly you can determine what is the value or the amount of money that's available per property wow. in the complex. And that, that works for me because very quickly you can do the math in and ask, is this sufficient, you know, if... if, if the complex needs to be repainted, or if um, some things needs to some things needs to to be done. Um, then also, uh, Stefan, to to speak about other risks, and I, I think you've identified some of them, is look at the structure of the property. Make sure that the property is in a good in a good condition. What I would often do, especially if I'm uncertain or if I see cracks that that concerns me or something like that, is I would get a property inspection company. In. You know, they don't charge a lot. They do an analysis on the property for you and they look at it structurally. They uh, climb into the roof. They, they, they look at in what condition the property is and they can, they can then um, give you an analysis. Um, it's also very important to know the suburbs in which you are investing. Uh, I, like to, I like to drive and walk in the suburbs where I invest in property because it gives me a real feel for what that suburb is like, what is crime like, what is what is the um, is it a suburb that I would like to invest in? So that's that's also something that one can do. Okay. Yoko, I just got a question. Um, so obviously, we deal with a lot of medical professionals that work very harsh hours. Uh, you mentioned earlier when you were still starting out in your property portfolio, uh, you literally drove to to Joburg on a on a Saturday and a Sunday, and you spent time watching and checking out in in investment properties and I think obviously that is crucial because you're investing physically in this asset. A doctor working harsh hours but still wants to invest in property and still want to make sure that he or she makes the right decision. How do you start your portfolio? How do you build the portfolio? What is easier ways um, to do that? That's a very important question and, and um, I think that's a question for any professional that basically sells hours. I mean a lot of a lot of professionals, um, doctors, lawyers, um, accountants, a lot of them sell hours, which means that your, your time is very valuable to you and, and you don't have all the time in the world, for, for example, for investing in properties. So one of the first things that I can, can say that, that is so important to have in place when you start building a property portfolio is to have an investment team in place. And that team might not be complete from day one and you might not be able to outsource everything from day one, but, but that is what you want to work towards as quickly as possible. And a team can consist of a lot of different parties. You can, for example, have a property mentor or a coach or somebody that 
actually invest in property and that can guide you in your strategy, in the areas that you want to invest and assist with a lot of the things that I had to figure out for myself when I started investing in property. Then it is critically important to have the right legal people on your team, people that can help you with the right structuring, people that can help you with the conveyancing, um, people that can help you with bigger deals with contracts, etc. Um, accounting people in your team is, is very, very important. Uh, accountants that understand the structures, if you use trusts, for example, and that can assist with that. You've got your finance team, if I can put it that way, your bond originators, your bankers, the, the team members that are going to help you to finance the properties that you want to acquire. And then maybe I should have said this one first because that's probably one of the first people that you as a doctor would want to have on your team and that's a handyman or a DIY guy because you don't want to, you don't want to go and fix a toilet on a Friday evening when a, tenant, um, when a tenant has a problem with a toilet or with a stove. So you want to have a very strong team in place and, and a very strong handyman in, in place that can take care of the general maintenance of property. That is, I always say that is something people get despondent when they think about all the maintenance that needs to take place in a property. If you have the right team in place, it, it doesn't, it, 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 it doesn't, it, it's not that burdensome. And the costs of maintaining a property is also something that you factor into your investment model that forms part of the expenses or the output costs of, of, of property investments. So, it's fine to have those expenses, but to have the right people on your team that can assist with that. And then lastly, I think real estate agents, uh, number one, and then letting agents, number two, very, very important to have on your team because if you have the right real estate agents in your team, they can help you to acquire good properties. Some of the best properties or, or yeah, some of, the, some of the very good investments that I've made were investments where the agent actually phoned me and said, listen, I've got this property, they understood my needs, and they could bring that property deal to me. And then, uh, of course, property management. I don't manage my own properties, even today still, even though I can, I can appoint my own people to, to run my property portfolio, but I prefer to outsource it because uh, what we said is we would rather spend that energy on that what we are skilled at. For you as a doctor, that would be practicing as a doctor or as a medical professional. Rather spend your time doing that what you are good at and outsource the property management and the letting to a company that does that 24 seven. That's true. So Jakob, where do you find these, these people? Um, because the reason why I'm asking is, you mentioned estate agents as an example, you mentioned accountants, you mentioned attorneys. Um, there's an estate agent and accountant at every corner nowadays. How do you find a reputable estate agent or an accountant, an attorney that knows what they, what, what they need to do? I think, I think referrals is a great way to, to, to find the right people. and then also to look for uh, team members or, or an investment team that, that understands property investment. Okay. There are a lot of attorneys out there and a lot of accountants out there that don't really, spe or that, that don't specialize in property investment. So you would want to work with a team that, that understands property and that focus on, on property investment. And that's also something that we've built in our company is to make, to, to, to provide our clients with the right team members that actually focuses on property investment. So if there's any listeners that is interested in building a, a property portfolio, um, those listeners can, for instance, reach out to your company and they can have a discussion and see, uh, get some guidance in terms of how to build up, how to set up this, this whole structure, am I right? Absolutely, we, we sit with, with our clients, we have a consultation where we determine exactly what the property needs are. We look at the structures that are required for that particular individual. And then we connect that individual with the right team members for them to start out and to start building their property portfolio. So if there's any listeners um, that is interested in building a property portfolio like that, who is looking for a team that can assist them, if they don't know anybody um, that is reputable, um, you are welcome to go to the Talk To Us button on Money & Medicine website, um, chat to us there, give us your details, we will put you in touch with Yaku, and then Yaku can set up a consultation with you where you can have more information about that discussion. Yaku, then uh, the other thing that we, we talked about is one of the strategies that we, we earlier spoke about is uh, buy to rent. What other property investment strategies are there? I know um, if, you, if you watch reality TV, um, I think the Americans are, are known for that to flip houses um, as an example. What other strategies are there? 
great. I, I think a great a, a great way to start for for many people that want to start in in property investment is to buy your own house or your own unit to start out with. Now, it's very important when you buy a home for yourself that you. I want to say that you keep the investment element and the sentimental or the emotional element separate. But often your first property acquisition can be it, it can be very good to acquire a unit for you to live in, especially if it is not that expensive a unit when you start out. Um, even if you stay there for six months or a year before you move out and then rent it out. And the reason why I say that is because there's a lot of elements of property investment that you get slowly exposed to then. For example, you don't immediately have to work with tenants because you are the tenant in that property renting from your company or your trust, for example. Um, another another nice um, advantage of living in one of your own investment properties is the fact that you don't have to worry about non-payment or tenants that are defaulting, for example, except if you are concerned that you're not going to pay yourself, of course. And then lastly, you've, you can renovate the property, you can make it beautiful, you can add value to the property, and you're going to benefit from that from an investment perspective as well because when you move out, when you sell that property, when you rent that property out, that money that you spent on that property added value from a rental or a capital growth perspective. So that could be, in certain instances, a good place to start. Then you touched on on the buy to rent, you know, uh, under the buy to rent strategy, there's a lot of different strategies. You've, for example, got a, what what one of the oldest, let's call it strategies in the book, is buying a property, paying it off as quickly as possible and living off the rental income. And let that rental income become a form of a passive income for you. But there's so many other ways as well. You can, for example, buy a property. When it appreciates in value, you can refinance the property and you can make a lot of capital available through the refinancing. And you can use that refinancing then to further expand your property portfolio. And what's nice about that is eventually you get to a place where your property portfolio is building itself. It doesn't require you to put your hard-earned money into this but that the property the property portfolio can actually itself grow by the refinancing and using that refinanced funds responsibly and then you have of course flipping and and there can be many different ways of of flipping as well but buying a property at a low price selling it at a higher price maybe buying it renovating it or fixing it up and selling it you could buy it fix it up or renovate it and rent it out so you can mix the strategies as well so so there's a couple of there's a couple of nice strategies that you can follow as well and mm. and then of course you've got all your different property classes you've got residential property you've got commercial property you've got industrial property um usually i, I always say you know just like with monopoly you start with the greenhouses before you go to the red hotels <laughs> you know so make your mistakes and and learn about property investment with the greenhouses uh -huh. and move over to the red hotels when you're an experienced property investor. That brings us to the end of this episode. Yaku, thank you so much. And, and thank you for availing yourself and for sharing so much information. For those of you that did watch this episode, we will also be handing out three of Yaku's books. Um, if you subscribe and just comment in the section below and say property, then we will reach out to you and you would stand a chance to win one of Yaku's books. We also want to encourage you, if this is the first time that you are watching this episode or this channel, please go to the bottom of this page, subscribe, leave some comments, we will get back to you. And feel free to check us out on www.moneyandmedicine.co.za. Until next time, plan the plan. Okay.